Um, before the world ended, um, I worked as a bartender. Um, I was not good at it. <laughs> but that's okay because this is the Netherlands, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I have to say, as an American, I feel like the Dutch approach to service is genius. It's so smart. It makes so much sense. Like, you guys get a lot of shit for it, I know. But in America, you live on tips, right, as a server. And so, like, the dynamic between the customer and the waiter is fucked up. Like, if I was serving you guys in America, I would have to come up and I would be like, hey guys, I'm gonna be your server, how are you doing? Are you doing so great? <laughs> you guys look amazing, you're gonna come with me, you're gonna be over here. Is it like a special day or just like a regular Tuesday? <laughs> like, come here, you're just gonna take a seat. So uh, I'm gonna be your server. Woo! Um, <laughs> can I get you anything? Do you want like french fries? Do you want a soda? Do you want me to dance for you? Yeah. Do you want to hit me with your car? <laughs> That's on the table. <laughs> Whereas in the Netherlands, you can rock up to a table like, what up, motherfuckers? <laughs> These are the menus. <laughs> now listen to me. <laughs> we both know I don't need you. <laughs> so why don't you tell me what you want? <laughs> I'll spend tonight deciding if I want to bring it to you. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> there are other jobs where I would say that maybe the Dutch perspective lends itself to less success. You know, like the way my Dutch therapist talks to me. I don't want to call it bullying. But it's pretty fucking close. At my, at my first appointment, my intake appointment, I was crying and my therapist goes, wow, you have a lot of feelings, don't you? It's a real thing she said to me. And I was like, I get it, Anamika, okay? You miss your regular appointment where like Jodin comes in and he's like, I've had a terrible week. And she's like, what happened? And he's like, I almost had a feeling. And she's like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Another job where I feel like it would be really difficult to be Dutch is being like a police officer in search of missing persons. Um, because like if I came in and I was like, you have to help me find my boyfriend. Like my dead boyfriend is missing. And they're like, okay, give us you know information about him. And I'm like, okay, he's like, um, he's like 1.9 meters tall, and he has perfect bone structure, and he has light brown hair that always looks like he like just got off a bike. <laughs> they're like, okay, ma'am, that's everyone. You know, you're gonna have to give us some specifics. Like, okay, uh, you work for Rabo Bank? And I'm like, okay, and I guess, yeah, that's helpful, great. <laughs> write that down. Um, and I'm like, okay, I know, I know a super specific one for my boyfriend. Like, every time you talk to him, you just get the sense that he just thinks he knows better than you. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, we're just gonna write down Dutch and just hope. <laughs> I, I'm aware that as an American, it's crazy for me to make fun of Dutch people, right? That's insane. <laughs> and I just want to say, this is all I have. <laughs> Please, I'm, I'm barely hanging on. <laughs> it's, um, it's a trip growing up in America, because they tell you things like, we're the greatest country on earth, and like, you're all going to go out and you're going like, to conquer the world, because we're the best, you know? And then you turn 18 and you go to Europe and you're like, I'm from America and we're the best. And everyone's like, have you read any world history? <laughs> and you're like, no, I went to school in America. <laughs> they don't teach us that, you know? Um, but I do feel like uh, it's a weird time to be an American abroad, but I'm finally understanding my grandparents. Because uh, historically, America has been like the country of immigrants. All four of my grandparents moved over. Uh, from Europe, from extreme poverty, in search of like greater opportunity, hoping to create like better, wealthier futures for their future generations. And now, like barely two generations later, I'm writing exactly the same letters home. <laughs> Dear mother, <laughs> I know you're trapped in the home country. <laughs> Try to bring you over soon. <laughs> <laughs> Bread is plenty.
plentiful in Europe. <laughs> try to send money home on Sunday, provided the plague doesn't take me before that. <laughs> it's, um, it's strange, like, moving to a new country, because I moved here not knowing anybody. And you have to, like, just be a completely new person and try to get people to know you. Um, and it's weird when you have, like, a complicated backstory. So I come from an insane family, um, a, like a crazy family, um, with, like, you're, like, run-of-the-mill, like, fun, like, doses of generational trauma and, like, mental illness <laughs> and alcoholism. Uh, but also fun things, like, in college, I almost dated my cousin <laughs> on accident because he was from the front family and I'm from the secret family. <laughs> didn't know each other existed. <laughs> so that kind of thing is hard to explain. <laughs> um, my, my parents did their best to protect my sister and I from like all of these insane things that have come from our family, but my grandma doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> she does not care. And she's been through so much shit in her life that she's like, I need to protect you, you know? You soft baby child. <laughs> like, she'll just drop huge family secrets on me out of nowhere. Like when I was 10, I was staying with her and we had a conversation that ended with her saying, yeah, so that's why we're pretty sure that your great uncle Lori murdered his second wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Grandma, I'm 10. <laughs> you can't just drop that on me. <laughs> <laughs> you little bitch. <laughs> that's not what she said to me. That's, that's not how my grandma talks to me. But it is the gist of it. <laughs> it's like there's this, this postmodern theory that I really like, which is like by telling a falsehood about the situation, sometimes you can get closer to what really happened than if you tell the truth. So like maybe what my grandma actually said was like, I don't think that you're too young to know that. But she and I both know that what really passed between us <laughs> was deal with it. <laughs> you little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> there are ways that like growing up in a family of alcoholics affects you. Like it, it makes you like very aware of your own relationship to alcohol. So when I got to college and I actually started drinking, um, I took like three months to be sober just to make sure I could quit. Um, and I, I don't know that I learned that much about my relationship with alcohol. I did have a really beautiful realization, which was uh, it was so nice to wake up every morning sober and think about all the times that I was so hungover and I woke up feeling so like irritable and grumpy and like sad and with a headache and feeling anxious and realizing it wasn't the hangover. It just feels terrible to be a human. <laughs> Because I moved here, no connections, no job, no apartment, like no plan whatsoever. And I think people assume that if you're a very anxious person, which I always have been, that you won't make huge, crazy decisions with no planning. Uh, but those people are making a major miscalculation, which is that I am also very stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I have anxiety, but it doesn't regulate me at all. <laughs> so I am anxious and then also make terrible decisions. <laughs> Chihuahua. I'm just like always shaking <laughs> and being a tiny fucking idiot. <laughs> in, um, in December, I made like a really huge decision uh, where I went off my antidepressants. I've been on the Supermax dose for five years. And in December of 2019, I was like, what could possibly happen? <laughs> go wrong. <laughs> like an idiot. Um, it's, actually, it's actually gone fine. It's been great. I'm doing fine. Um, I have to say the difference between the way that my American doctors and my Dutch doctors approached my psychiatric history has been very interesting. Uh, because my American psychiatrist is the worst. 
He's a 1,000 year old turtle of a man. <laughs> I hate him. <laughs> he was always like, you know, with like your like genetic predisposition and the severity of your depression, you'll likely be on this medication for the rest of your life. And my Dutch doctor was like, you want to go have your meds? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, okay. <laughs> months if you want to kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's, I, I think like the journey to like figuring out how to like be okay and be healthy is very interesting. And there are different ways that you approach it. Like uh, I think the foundation of me starting to get better was making better choices for myself. So when I moved to the Netherlands two years ago, I decided that I was going to do a really cool new thing just for myself where I was only going to have sex with people who were nice to me. That's a joke, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I got a little too dark there. So. <laughs> um, but uh, for like the first four months that I was here, uh, no takers. <laughs> no takers at all. And it's not that never having sex is a bad thing. It's just that if that's not what you're going for, it can get a little bleak. <laughs> <laughs> so after four months, I was like, you know what, fuck it, I'll get rid of the rule. I'll have sex with all these Dutch people who have been honest with me. <laughs> <laughs> so I got rid of the rule and didn't make a difference. <laughs> Turns out Dutch people are just not that into me. <laughs> and I get it, you know, I'm American, I'm kind of whiny, I'm not tall enough to be Dutch, but I'm not short enough to be interesting here. <laughs> that makes sense. And, and my experiences dating haven't been incredible. Like I've, I've dated both men and women. They each come with like their own set of things. Uh, so like when you're dating women, uh, I always find it hilarious when people talk about the gay agenda. <laughs> There's always some like old southern dude who's like, they're gonna take my son and they're gonna turn him gay and bring him to hell. You know? It's like, first of all, nobody wants to date your son, Dale. Okay? <laughs> Relax. Second of all, the gay agenda isn't about turning straight people gay, so they'll go to hell. Okay? <laughs> That's just part of it. <laughs> the real gay agenda is about turning straight people gay, so we'll stop having children and the human race will die out. <laughs> cities will crumble. <laughs> Our endangered species will return. There's sea oceans. And forests will thrive. And the Amazon rainforest will come back. And the earth will be as it was meant to be before everything died out when we ruined it. <laughs> so, environmentalism, I would say, is the gay agenda. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are interesting things that people ask you when they find out that you um, date women. Like they're like, when did you know? Um, I wish I had like a cooler answer for that. It was more like when I was eight, I saw a girl at my dance studio. And I was like, I sure like looking at her. <laughs> Guess we'll never know what that means. And I didn't think about it um, for eight years. <laughs> and then when I was 16, there was this like beautiful new girl who walked onto my bus. And I was like, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I like pussy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Now, coming out is an interesting process. I didn't have like a big coming out. I just sort of like dropped hints in different ways. Um, some of them were positive. Some of them were more negative. Um, positive way is like my mom was like, yeah, do you like anyone at school? And I was like, oh, there's like a couple cute guys, and there's like this one cute girl on my bus. And my mom was like, oh, because <laughs> she's like a fun mom. <laughs> um, a negative way I would say that people found out is when I accidentally airplayed lesbian porn onto my <laughs> family TV. <laughs> <laughs> While my mom and sister were watching The Crown. <laughs> and boy, they were not chill about it. <laughs> Running up to my door and they're like, "What's going on in there?" I was like, "We all know what's going on here, okay, guys? I think we know." But I wasn't like confident enough to play it off, so I just came out and I was like, "I was watching Orange Is the New Black." But I now I've learned that 
but to get over embarrassing things, you just have to embrace them. So now I come home every year and I'm like, hey mom, happy Thanksgiving, what's up? Do you remember that time that I airplaned lesbian porn onto our TV? <laughs> <laughs> and I said it was Orange is the New Black. It wasn't Orange is the New Black. <laughs> <laughs> it was lesbian porn. <laughs> oh, boy, boy were those lesbians lesbianing. <laughs> 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 I, um, <laughs> uh, I have to say though, like my experiences dating men, also not great. Uh, <laughs> it turns out even the perks of being a woman dating men aren't really perks. You're like, oh, I can't wait to outlive my life partner. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a cool three to five years at the very end. <laughs> <laughs> I've dated guys on both ends of the nice guy spectrum, so I've dated like straight up jerks who are afraid of vaginas, but I've also dated self-proclaimed feminists who have somehow also managed to make that suck. <laughs> like when you're kissing them, you can just feel how proud of themselves they are, <laughs> because they think you're a person. <laughs> or if you didn't know what to do when you were kissing someone, that you should just write the alphabet with your tongue. And with these guys, you could just feel them writing, I'm not like the other boys. So. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, we get it, Cody. You're a feminist. Stop talking about how you have sisters. That's not relevant. <laughs> down on you. It's not that it's bad. It's just that every time they come up, they look like they've just single-handedly closed the wage gap. <laughs> it's just like a lot of energy to be coming at you when you're in a vulnerable position. <laughs> Despite all of that, I am actually dating somebody now. Um, it turns out, if you're an American in the Netherlands that Dutch people aren't into, you don't have to be alone forever. You just have to find a Canadian who hates himself. That's <laughs> 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 so beautiful. <laughs> um, I'm joking, he doesn't hate himself. It's actually like the best relationship that I've ever been in. Um, it's a fantastic relationship. I love him so much. Um, uh, and, um, and the great thing about being in a relationship that's like really loving and that you like trust and respect each other is you can just let go of all like the shitty things that the people you've dated before have done to you. You know? Like that guy Peter who fucked you over your senior year of college, right? <laughs> like you don't even have to think about him because you're happy now. <laughs> the thing about the thing with Peter is it's just like <laughs> I was dating him, and then there was this girl, Dahlia, who was like, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to know about it, because I've moved on. <laughs> and I'm fulfilled now. <laughs> just in case, though, I just drew like a super quick diagram. <laughs> didn't really do anything wrong, that's fine. And then he was dating Dahlia, and uh, I'm trying to stick to like not, I'm not, I'm trying not to talk shit about other women. That's important to me. So I'm just gonna stick to the facts here. So her name was Dahlia, we went to college together, and she was a massive bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so like, yeah, I was dating Peter, and Ben was dating Dahlia, and then one day, Ben and I were hanging out, and we walked into a party, and Peter was making out with Dahlia. <gasps> it's too late, you already missed it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so crazy because I don't know if you've been paying attention, but uh, those are actually the people we were dating. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so funny. <laughs> um, it does actually have a happy ending though, because uh, I live here now, and Peter and Dahlia still live in America because they're chumps. <laughs> Just um, just one.
once again, this is our main character, Olivia. Um, just to like any casting directors out there, uh, just picture like your classic best friend type. Uh, sort of like cute enough to be on screen, but not cute enough to be threatening. You know? <laughs> uh, I don't want to sound desperate. I do know casting directors. It's just the only one I know is my aunt. And she's already given me a firm no <laughs> to projects. Something about how directors aren't looking to cast women who dress like the world's most boring witch. <laughs> and then this is Peter. Just like a really photorealistic drawing of him. Um, this is just exactly what he looked like. Um, all that really matters that you need to know about him is uh, it's not always true what they say about Big Feet. So just, <laughs> <laughs> just keep that in mind. And then here we have a blank page just to represent. Blank page that I've turned over here. <laughs> because, you know, my life is, is so fresh and new, you know? Because <laughs> I've so clearly moved on. <laughs> and I just like to think of this as representing, you know, what, what could come in the future and what I could write for myself going forward. Because you don't have to think about the people who've hurt you. You just think about the people that you'll love in the future. Yeah. And then just super fast, just a Peter was hit by a truck. <laughs> that one's more for me than anything. I just like to look at it sometimes. <laughs> just when I'm alone, you know. Uh, but anyway, that's going to be my story about Peter. So thank you all so much for that time. <laughs>
it tonight because who am I kidding? Of course I am. Two, three, four. Snuggly clothes, snuggly clothes. I am wearing my snuggly clothes. They are really snuggly and they are clothes. That's why we call them my snuggly clothes. like losing my identity a little bit just because like our relationship is so sweet um, and um, and I, I I'm used to thinking of myself as pretty tough like I, I moved here by myself I've like dealt with like my mental health issues on my own I've taken responsibility for myself uh, I work as a bartender as a female bartender a lot of the time it like requires that you be tough so I spent a lot of my shifts being like what are you doing don't talk to me like that how dare you don't hit on me ambient asshole get out <laughs> But at home, my boyfriend calls me muffin. <laughs> and he refers to our bed as the muffin tray. <laughs> because that's where little muffins sleep. <laughs> so it's super weird to like get home from like a night of yelling at people. I like slam the door and take my leather jacket off. <laughs> doing out of her tray. Tip jar. 